a recirculating aquaculture system RAS pipeline farm. This means hundreds of meters, sometimes kilometers, of pipelines that wrap around the entire hangar from the inside like a web. For the system to work properly and efficiently, this web must be properly and carefully designed. Over the years, I've encountered a huge number of mistakes and issues on farms due to improperly designed and poorly planned pipelines, both on other people's farms and in my own projects. I've learned a lot of hard lessons from this, and these experiences have taught me valuable lessons that I will never forget. And today, I want to share with you how to properly lay out and design pipelines for RAS systems. My name is Anton Pelcher, I'm an engineer, and I build fish farming facilities for over 10 years. All right, let's break it down together. The specifics of designing RAS pipelines, as hands-on as possible. It's one thing to just talk about it, but it's much better to talk and show at the same time. That's why I chose my favorite branch of pipes on this farm. It's just that they're very conveniently accessible while all the others are hidden somewhere. Let's take a look right here. Let's start, I'm not sure why, but I've just gotten used to it traditionally with the drain pipes from the fish tanks to the drum filter. So this is what's called the drain branch of the pipeline. Here it is, the orange one made from a regular PVC sewer pipe, as you can see. Let's go over the design nuances. Let's start with the fact that the water from the tanks, the water flows through these pipes, but not entirely by gravity. Everyone is usually used to saying it's gravity fed, but in reality, it's under hydrostatic pressure. Right now, the height from the floor to the water column in the tank is about two meters and it presses on the pipeline, meaning the pipes are completely filled. The logic of water movement here is different from that in sewer pipes, which are only partially filled and the water just runs through them and then the pipe is empty and sits idle. Here, ours is completely filled. The first nuance is speed. You need to design the pipelines with the right diameter to ensure the required flow speed. Therefore, depending on the flow rate through the pipe, the diameter increases or decreases. There is a standard that I am used to following. The speed of water flow in drain pipes should be from 0.8 meters per second to 1.2 meters per second. Based on this speed, using basic sixth grade math, it's easy to calculate what the internal diameter of the pipe should be and select a standard diameter. This is a pipe that goes upward. This is a riser. First of all, it's an air vent, which means that any excess air is able to escape through it because when water from the pool's upper overflow enters the drain pipe, it often carries air bubbles along with it. Next, I want to talk about how water enters the collector. You can see that there is a 45 degree T fitting here. If you look closely, you will notice it is indeed a 45 degree T fitting. In other words, any water inlet should not be perpendicular. Instead, it should turn and enter at a 45 degree angle. This approach ensures that the flows of water will not collide with each other, and as a result, we will have smooth movement and minimal pressure loss. Here's another interesting feature as we go along. For now, it's a 160 millimeter pipe since the outlet is only from one pool. The water exchange from one pool is 60 cubic meters per hour. A 160 millimeter pipe handles that just fine. Next, we have the connection of the second pool, and here, the transition to a larger diameter takes place. This one, as I understand it, is 250. So here, they decided not to use 200, but to go straight to 250. Well, basically, that's not a big deal. Just like before, the outlet from the pool, a 45 degree T, and the connection enters this pipe at an angle. And notice, the transition to the new diameter happens before the inlet. Not after the second pool is connected, but the transition happens before the inlet. So first, you switch to a larger diameter, install a bigger T fitting, and only then do you continue with the larger collector. This is a pipe. Many people are used to laying it with a slope. In reality, this pipe does indeed need a slight slope, but not so that the water flows more efficiently, but only so that first, any air bubbles that may form inside can escape more easily, so you can conveniently drain the collector if necessary. That is, you open the drain valve on the collector and you drain it. Let's talk about assembling these pipes while we walk. They're assembled using glue. Even though standard sewer pipes have rubber seals, those rubber seals only work in sewage mode when the pipe isn't completely filled. When they hold, everything works as expected, but as soon as the pipe is completely filled with water, they begin to leak. So the rubber rings are removed from the pipes and everything is carefully coated with a special PVC glue to ensure a tight seal. And accordingly, this entire pipe, this whole collector system is assembled using glue. What else can I say about it? Well, basically, if we're talking about pipelines, specifically about laying these pipes under concrete, I personally would not recommend using PVC. Instead, I would recommend using HDPE pipes, which are generally more reliable in such situations. So everything that's below the concrete should definitely be HDPE. Next, I'll talk about the collector's turns. 
Take a look here. The lower pipe, just like the upper one, turns at a 45 degree angle. And then another 45 degrees. For drain pipelines and actually for pressure pipelines as well, it's recommended to avoid 90 degree angles as much as possible. If we need to make a 90 degree turn, we do it in two 45 degree turns. In other words, we don't make a single 90 degree turn because it creates a lot of resistance, turbulence, breaks up the sewage in the pipe and so on. Now let's take a look at the inlets to the drum filter. First of all, we have four drums here working in parallel. Plus, there's also a separate pipeline. This one here comes from the hydrocyclones. By the way, this is a very important point. For us, at least, the hydrocyclones work better when they're connected by a separate pipe, not a shared one. What stands out here, do you see? Well, first of all, before the main entrance and before each individual drum filter, there's a gate valve, and that's extremely important. You need to be able to shut off, to close this valve in case the drum filter needs to be repaired. Or if you need to stop the water flow, after the pumps have stopped operating, it's absolutely necessary and essential to have these gate valves in place. If they now, moving on to some other interesting features of the system. Here, we could have entered with a simple 90 degree turn quite easily and then directly into the drum, but instead we install this particular kind of P-fitting and a vertical riser pipe. Why is that? Well, you see, it's so that we don't have any air locks. That's why this riser is also very important. And additionally, it's for monitoring the operation. And it also serves as a device, let's say, as an access point for cleaning the pipe if necessary, or if there is ever a need for maintenance. And on that side, the vent stack serves as an important part of the overall system, providing ventilation and ensuring proper function. In fact, as a clean out for the entire collector, so we don't need any separate systems for cleaning or inspection. Sewer clean outs won't work with this kind of pipe because as soon as you open the clean out, water will gush out. The sewer pipe is empty, but this pipe is full. And finally, let's go, I'll show you. A completely inconspicuous, but very important detail. Take a look down here there are two gate valves here 110 millimeter ones what are these this is for draining the entire manifold if I open the valve now all the water from the manifold will drain into the sewer here is the sewer and the second valve works the same way it's for the large manifold this is a mandatory requirement you must be able to properly drain the drum filters drain manifold now let's go and take a look at the pressure manifold together all right, let's get started. We're going to look at our pressure manifold from the pumps. They draw water from the biofilter. To ensure they are properly designed, we must have a gate valve on the suction side before the pump. Here it is. If the pumps are installed above the water level, then we need to install a check valve like a flap type on the suction side. Otherwise, when you're switching between pumps, water can actually drain out from the pipeline and as a result, your pump simply will not start at all. On the pressure manifold, a check valve is required as well as another gate valve and a tap. And then comes the connection and transition to the supply pipeline. What would I like to point out here? First of all, as you can see, the material used for this pipe is different. That is, this is now pressure rated blue PVC because there is pressure here. And assembling pipelines from sewer pipes here would not be very good, to put it mildly. That's exactly why everything here is much more solid and stable. To the, mark. the water velocity in pressure pipelines, in my opinion, should be from 1.5 to 2.5 meters per second. That's why the diameters here are smaller than in the drain collector. But this collector is 315, meaning the drain ended up being 400 and the supply is 315. Here, 45 degree bends are not as critical anymore. They are desirable, but not as essential. So to simplify things, we still use the 90 degree elbow here. Now about connecting the oxygenators, if you pay attention there, the collector comes into the oxygenator, meaning there are two inlets into the oxygenator, two outlets from the oxygenator, and this little gate valve and a separate pipe. This is a bypass. What is the bypass for? It's so that you have the ability to disconnect any oxygenator and let the water flow around it. This is very important in order to take any device out of service for maintenance, repair or anything else. And then the water will continue steadily on its way along this 315 gray collector. The water continues its journey onward. And it goes, goes, goes into the pools. Here we can already do without making 45 degree turns since the pressure is more than sufficient. 
Here we have a 90 degree outlet, a 110 millimeter supply to the pool. Naturally, a valve is installed before each supply to the pool. Here, there is no need for any soil stacks or anything like that, absolutely not, because this is a pressurized collector. Now let's take a look at the air ducts. This is also an interesting topic. It's gonna be a bit noisy here. Here we have, in fact, the connection for the blowers. Here you can see three blowers, two are operational, and one serves as a backup. They are responsible for working with the biofilters. The blowers, the airflow, and the intake system are all important. An adapter and an air filter are installed on the intake. This is the air intake, which also acts as a dust filter. On the outlet, a spacer and a check valve are installed so that the blowers can operate automatically. You cannot do without these components, especially without this check valve, which is essential for proper operation. Next comes a steel adapter to the required diameter. It's best to make everything out of metal here because it heats up and could potentially melt if made from other materials. Next, each blower has a valve on the outlet so we can shut off the ones that are not currently working or peaks. But without a check valve, they simply will not work when switching over. And then everything is carefully combined into a single common manifold. Here, there is a pressure relief valve installed. So if the pressure ever exceeds the safety limit, the valve will open automatically. In this case, it seems the pipe was overheating, so they replaced it with a more durable steel one, a manifold. Actually, that's the right thing to do. The first meter or two of piping from the blowers should ideally be constructed entirely of metal because it heats up during operation. That way, they immediately cool it down since it acts as an excellent heat exchanger. And in fact, it cools the air coming from the blowers. Well, after that, it transitions to plastic and off it goes. An important point is that at the outlet, on the manifold coming out of the blowers, right here and here for each group, a pressure gauge is installed. The pressure gauge on the blower should be for low pressure. Now let's take a closer look at the manifolds coming from the blowers, which is the area where we just were just a moment ago. Basically, we have a manifold of a larger diameter. The calculated airflow velocity in the pipeline for selecting the diameter should be about 8 to 10 meters per second. By the way, the same principle applies to oxygen pipelines. From the main manifold, since there are four chambers here, there are four of these branches coming out. They are already smaller in diameter, and from them, separate pipelines with valves go to the diffusers. You can see what this looks like. Everything is done the same way as the pressure pipe for water made from solvent welded PVC. And here, in fact, is where the aeration of the biofilter takes place. There are also oxygen pipelines here on the farm. You can clearly see how they are carefully laid out along both the walls and the roof of the building. Here, in this particular case, they are made of copper. But in fact, I strongly recommend using stainless steel especially if we're talking about a centralized oxygen supply system. I do not recommend using plastic materials because plastic, it lets oxygen through, but it's generally not reliable and it even allows oxygen to pass through its walls by diffusion. So if you want to lay a truly reliable line, I especially recommend using stainless steel as it is known for its durability. The speed of oxygen flow in the pipes is also eight to 10 meters per second. Sewage about sewage. I'm not even going to say much of anything because the standards for designing sewage systems are the same everywhere. In other words, there are no special sewage features in RAS, recirculating aquaculture systems. I only recommend providing a diameter that can handle sudden discharges, various drainings, pools, and so on into the sewage system. That is, it shouldn't be too small. Well, that's basically it. Today, I told you about some features of pipeline design on RAS farms. I hope you found it useful. If so, give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. This was Anton Felcher with you. My channel is about how to raise fish and make good money from it. Bye.